Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of True Say with CBJ and I am your host Jerno. In today's episode, I had a powerful conversation with Tijan Sala. He's a hip hop artist and also a cultural advocate working tirelessly to make art and culture accessible to the community through his role at the Arts Council. Tijan bravely opens up about his life, taking us back to his upbringing in the challenging environment of North London, growing up on a council estate in a single parent household. He reflects on the impact of his father's absence, revealing the struggles he encountered and the strength that carried him through. Tijan recently became a father, but also dealing with the challenges of being separated from his own son. With candid vulnerability, he let us in on how he navigate these difficulties to where he draws his strength from. Now, this episode was filled with raw authenticity and resilience. Tijan's story is a testament to the human spirit's capacity to overcome and find meaning in life's trials. Thank you and enjoy. All right, three, two, one. Tijan, thank you for doing this, man. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's great to be with you, cuz. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. I appreciate man. you. I appreciate you taking your time to to do this, man. I know we we already yeah. kind of had a short conversation on the phone the other day. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we were just connecting and there was a lot of things we you know, we wanted to talk about, so I decided, you know, it's great for, you know, to have you on the podcast. So um so thank you for 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 doing this, man. This is absolute pleasure. Um it's my pleasure. You know, with yeah. family, and yeah. um, you know, you know, I, I want to support that. Obviously, I was somewhat hesitant because, mm-hmm. you know, I know the nature of the conversation that we're going to have. I kind of, I can, I can kind of anticipate some of the questions that are coming in, mm-hmm. and you know, touching on some sensitive issues. And I guess I was yeah. wondering about how I feel about throwing them into this, you know, into the public forum as such. But yeah, I think. You you said something to me about how important it is that like, other people that are going through stuff, you know, if they can connect and resonate with your story, it may help them. And uh, and that's kind of what made me go, yeah, you know what, I really want to do this. You know, a your family and b it can impact on other people in a positive way. So if it can, then that's good. And um, it's also the motivation behind, you know, it's something, it's something I've wanted to do as well. I've been thinking about podcasting. I mean, you know Nova, I brought him up to Gambia with you. He's been very active mm. with the podcasting thing as well. I've been thinking about it and very much thinking on the angle about how helpful, how beneficial it can be when you listen to people whose stories you can connect with. So kind of, yeah, that's that's motivated me to go down that route as well. Like I'm thinking about doing that kind of stuff. So yeah, this is a great testing ground right now, man. Yeah, it, it, and it takes a lot of courage to talk about these things because, you know, like for me, example, where we're from, we don't really have these kind of sensitive, you know, topics. And when I, when I was even approaching you in the beginning, that was never even my, my aim, you know, to talk about certain um, things that you're Mm -hmm. going through or whatever, because like, I want this podcast to be very authentic and I have to be authentic myself for it to be authentic. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've never been the type of person that likes to watch even people go on social media or go on like TV and then talk about like some of the things that are happening in their life, because I always believe that you have to have some sort of a um, certain things you have to keep it to yourself. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's always like a strange thing. But when I, as I told you earlier, that it's not only about that, but I want you to know too, it's like a message that you're sending to other people who are going through the same things. And then then they can relate to know that there is, you know, there's a light at the end of that tunnel. So, but it takes mm-hmm. a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to do, you know, so, so really, really appreciate that. But also it's like, in the beginning, I wanted to more understand on your journey, you know, because it's surprising, but it's also sad a bit that we grew up or like we we grew up from two different worlds. You know, we're family. And when I say family, mm-hmm. we are very close, man. Like we are mm-hmm. first cousins. We are very mm-hmm. like our blood is very thick. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and of course, it's not our fault that we were we didn't come from the same world. And so that was like one of the main reasons was like, I really need to know. You know, there's a part of me that want to know, like, you know, where where did it all started with you? Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm talking about from the neighborhood you grew up around with, you know, mm-hmm. some of the the moments in your upbringing that left like footprints and marks to shape you to who you are today. So if you yeah, could okay. share some insight, for example, on, on those things. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I've never really asked the story about like how my mom and my dad met, 
That's one yeah. thing. People always say, how, really? do you, how do they meet? Yeah. I, you know, I never really ask. I never wow. really ask. And I have the opportunity to ask all the time. And I, I don't know why I never do. Um, you know, like I have like memories of my dad when I was a child and, um, and photos and all sorts of things. And, um, yeah. So, you know, my mum's from the UK, um, in North London, uh, and, and that's where she met my dad. And I've heard bits and bobs about, you know, the trials and tribulations they faced in their relationship early on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, Bob, but when my dad was in the UK at first, he hadn't done no paperwork, nothing, man. He was the original. I didn't know. Yeah, he wasn't there know. legally. You know, he wasn't there legally. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So he, he hadn't done. So effectively, my dad was an illegal immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, the only household I remember is the household I was in up until maybe a year ago. So I spent the best part of my entire life in North London, in a, in a place called Bill Close, an estate called Bill Close, mm. uh, which is like Palmer's Green, Borderline Wood Green. Um, you know, it's a council estate. Um, it's full of all the same sort of things that you would associate with council estates. Um, there's a lot of people that are facing economic challenges. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of barriers for you accessing support because of all the financial challenges, you know, um, there's drugs, there's crime, um, all of these things. And, um, you know, my mom and dad, their relationship, I don't know how, how committed they ever were to each other. So I spent a lot of time really just my mom. So effectively I could say, you know, really born into a single parent family situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and we all kind of like, the narrative is worn out, but you know, I would say like, look, and I've got that story from a single parent household in a council estate, surrounded by crime. Um, so basically every challenge in circumstances, my mum was fighting hard just to make ends meet. We didn't really have that much money. So I didn't have privilege. It's not like I could go to drama lessons or, you know, or like, mm. you know, uh, do like after sports clubs and stuff. Cause my mum just didn't have the money for me to do that. And, um, yeah. And early on, I guess like my dad wasn't as around as much as I would have liked him. I think he tried, he had his own things going on, but, um, he, um, I always thought I didn't care about it. Like I always thought no, it didn't bother me. Like I'd used it as an excuse. Mm -hmm. Like, so I, I didn't really do well in mainstream school, not because I wasn't academic. I was just causing trouble early in life. And when I say causing trouble, I wasn't like violent or fighting, but I was just very talkative, hyperactive, easily bored, talk back maybe to the tutors and teachers and stuff. Just had very witty. Yeah, I was just like a rebel from day dot one. And I got kicked out of schools and, and every time in school, they'd be like, oh, you know, you know, what's TJ's T problem? Is it, maybe it's because his dad isn't around. They would say stuff like that. And I'd be like, yeah, that sounds like a good excuse. Cause it didn't bother me. I felt like it didn't bother me mm -mm. and I was just doing my thing. So I, when people used to say that stuff, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause my dad ain't around. Like, okay, if that's my get out of jail card free, you know, that's my get out of jail free card, then I'll use it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause my dad weren't around. Like, okay. Um, but I thought it didn't bother me, but as time's gone on, I realized how much his presence, how much I missed his presence. Mm -hmm. Uh, how much it did bother me. Uh, even like just before having this conversation, I spoke to my mom and I said, oh, mom, my cousin's calling. I'm, I'm not sure whether I want to do it. She, she goes, I think it's great that you do this kind of thing. I yeah. said, but you know, sometimes I wonder like, you know, like what, what, like what impact did my dad? Was it my fault that me and my dad didn't connect? Was it my dad's fault? Mm -hmm. And my mom said, you know what? The one time I'll never forget how hurt you was one time when, your dad said he was coming to pick you up, but he didn't come. And you were a tiny child and it hurt you. Like I could see you were so hurt and I was so upset with him for not coming through. And um, because of that, like I, um, I think like I realized that I probably wore a shield about it and acted like I didn't care and went through my life. But I think it's had a big impact on me coming up all the way through it my will, life. And will. later on, as I, as I get older, I feel that impact more and I feel his absence more now, 
you know? So yeah, that, 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 that was my, you know, that was the environment. That was the context of the family environment I was in, you know, and, uh, music, music was one of my, my saviors. Music, music yeah. was a big thing for me. So, so yeah, talking about, you know, shielding it and all those things, um, as you know, for people who are listening to know that you got into rapping and if I'm mm. not wrong, it's underground rapping. So I mm. want to understand also from the beginning, like what were some of the influences, you know, some of the inspiration that actually sparked you to, you know, to get into rapping? Oh man, it's so many, it's so many, so many different angles and so many, it's like a culmination of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so pinpointing it down to one thing is really hard. Cause there's just different sets of circumstances and different things. Um, when I was like a kid growing up, like the big underground movement in, in London and the UK was like, was jungle. Some call it drama based jungle music. So like fast, high tempo stuff. And like, that was the only way you would hear UK guys spitting bars. Like in that time, in that era, when I was coming up as a kid, so late nineties, hip hop was predominantly, it was just American. Americans yeah. do that. Americans rap. British people, we can't rap. No one else in the world had permission to rap. It was an American <laughs> thing and you didn't do that. So mm -hmm. the only voice I heard of people over like beats mm -hmm. was like j jungle. So around that time, I think 1997 was the first time I sort of came out as an MC. Um, mm -hmm. And we were sitting at my boy's yard uh, you know, like coming up on the estate, as I said, so we go up to my friend's house. He had the per turntables, vinyls. Yeah. We'd be mixing and everyone wanted to DJ everyone. So it was hard to get your turn, but you know, the mic would always just be like hanging about. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was an opportunity to pick up the mic. And I was shy to do that even. But one day, like we were all sitting in his house mm -hmm. and he was like, yo, spit your favorite bar, spit one of your MC's favorite bar. And we were in the circle and he was like, pointing around to everyone, go on, you spit your face, everyone spit. And we were all nervous, like, no, no, no. Like it was a bit of a joke, you know? But yeah. um, everyone, he went around the room one by one and most of the people were older than me. And up until this time, I was like the, the runt of the pack, like the little, little T, little T. How old were you? You know, probably about 13, 14. Wow. And so everyone else, every, they were all like 16, 17, older, bigger. At that time, that's like a world of difference when you're mm. young like that, you know? And they would always like, mock me. I would always be the brunt of the jokes. So everyone's going around now doing their bars and it gets to me and I'm thinking, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. They're going to, I'm always getting it, you know, cause I'm the youngest. So I'm just going to get it. Like, but I thought, okay. And I didn't even rap someone else's lyrics. I just had, I just freestyled my own thing. Mm. And uh, so I just said some lyrics that were weak. I was a little kid. Like those are some weak lyrics, but at the time, everyone just stopped and was like, what? That was good. Like, what? Yeah. Yo, go again, go again. So, I, you know, I did it again and everyone was like, yo, so you're sick. And like, I call him my brother. He's like, he's not biologically my brother, but I've grown up with him since a kid, you know, my, my bro Adrian from Ghana. And he, um, he was like, bro, you got something, man. Like rather than mocking me, he was like, you should put pen to paper. You should write lyrics. Mm -hmm. Like you, you sound sick. And he encouraged me. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of me. So now whenever I went to the house and they had the turntables, I'd pick up the mic and I start, and everyone would get behind it and back it. Mm -hmm. And so it started as a jungle MC thing. And as the UK scene evolved and garage music became the big thing in London at one point, I was mm -hmm. like garage MC. And, but then I went to study, I went to university. And I wanted to be more expressive. I wanted to say more. And I felt like hip hop tempo allowed more room for expression. You could talk more, you could really yeah. put a narrative. And I was maturing and my writing skills was getting better. So that it just fitted into that realm. And so that's when I started to, so between the gap of 14 to 21, it kind of evolved from jungle, garage, and then eventually hip hop. Mm. But I'd always liked hip hop. I just yeah. thought I could never, I never envisioned UK people rapping. I just thought it was something we couldn't, we're not allowed to do it. It's American. Mm. We can't do it. It took me a long time to feel the confidence to go, yo, I'll rap. Mm. So, but as a child though, saying that, like, even though when I said I come up through jungle music and that there were still artists I was listening to 
Uh, my cousin was giving me CDs of like Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, yeah. oh. um, you know, all all of that. Especially Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, Dre, all that West Coast stuff. I was rinsing that um, when I was a kid. So would and you then say I like more? So would you say you were one of the first ones like in that time in that mm-hmm. to to start really rapping like that or no? Were so there, other there were, people there, doing that. There were pioneers. I just I just missed it. I didn't mm. realize it was happening. So there, okay. there's been guys, there's been guys before me. And now the beautiful thing is I've earned my credibility. You know what I mean? I've earned my stripes in the game to that these point guys are my peers or I know them or I can, I can speak to them. Mm. But there was people before me. I just, I wasn't aware of it because it's so mm. underground. But these guys have got a lot of credibility now. So there were people like Skinny Man, um, Chester Peedy, the guys are from North London. But then before that, there was like the likes of Rodney P., um, so if you do your research, if you Google these guys like Rodney P, um, it was like old school hip hop groups, like yeah. I think they were called Gunshot, like from the eighties, like this super London posse, like this super, super old school stuff. Mm-hmm. And they were UK guys spitting, but I, I wasn't aware of it because all I could see was the mainstream stuff coming in through America. I just mm-hmm. didn't think us guys in UK did it. So there were a few, but I was, I, I guess I'm part of that legacy, I guess, as I, as I followed on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as yeah. as time goes, um, with your writing and your creative art, did you, yeah. with everything that you've went through, of course, like in the area that in like um the environment that you grew up in, yeah. did you use your music also as a way of self expressing? You know all the emotions and everything that you've been going through. Yeah, hundred percent. Like um, it was like it was catharsis, man. It was like healing. It was getting it was getting everything that I needed off of my chest. Mm-hmm. And people really started to connect with my music when I started really telling stories that were from the heart. That's when mm-hmm. that's when I knew I was maturing. That's when I would say I went from just being an MC to being mm-hmm. an artist. Mm-hmm. And now I was talking about my feelings. And so that process was healing. It was important. You don't realize it, but it's therapeutic. You're basically sitting there, you're getting very introspective. You're just sitting, you're in a room on your own with a beat playing. And often that beat will be matching a certain vibration that's going on in your soul. Nine yeah. times out of 10, if you're playing a beat and you're like, ooh, I feel this beat, this is the beat I want to write to, mm-hmm. then something about that beat is resonating with your, well, in my case, it's resonating with my mood. So if it's a slow beat and it's got a certain emotion or and mm-hmm. I can hear a certain pain or certain, maybe certain hope within it, I might listen to that and go, right, this is, this is the perfect bedding. This is the perfect soundscape for the emotions that I want to let out. Or sometimes it might be like super aggressive and dark and moody and aggressive and like testosterone full of, yeah. and that might be that I'm pissed off and that's my energy right now. And I need Mm. to express like that. This is how I'm feeling right now. I'm rebel, Mm. I'm angst. So the the beat was always like finding a beat that matched my mood. That was what, where it all started. Mm. And then it truly expressing my emotions. Mm. And it's deep, you know, because, you know, going back to the family connection and that, my dad didn't know I did this the whole time. My dad never, he never knew I did music, right? He never knew. And bi- some of my biggest memories are sitting in the car with my dad as a child and him bumping the tunes. He'd be bumping some Gambian rhythms. Yeah. <laughs> people, people um, singing in Wolof. Yeah. Uh, but I, and, and I was a kid like in London. So I was like, oh, kind of embarrassed, wanting to hide in the car. But that's, wow. You know, yeah, I know. That's a shame, right? You're like, mm. I should be proud of that, right? Mm. But I, it was different in London. Yeah, back then you would get mocked for being African, bro. Of course, yeah, yeah. You get mocked. You would get mocked for it, and like, and that's 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 a shame. But it is what it is, right? Mm. So, but my early memories of my dad was was him playing like track, but he would also play like reggae as well, like Bob Marley and stuff like that. And mm. uh, so, those are my early memories of my dad. But he never knew I did music. Wow. And I think when he first brought it to my attention was my younger sister, like my sister from my, you know, my dad's side. Yeah. Uh, she had heard a song where I was talking about my mom and my dad and their breakup. Mm. And she was like, she said to my dad, dad, is this true? Like, oh. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how that's, it, that's crazy. That's how it got back to my dad. So my dad calls me up now and is like, T, you're doing all the rap and stuff. Like, mm. um, you know, you know, your sister found the music and she's pointed out that she's all excited. She's found all this stuff on Google, but you know, you're saying all this stuff. And I was like, yo dad, that's my perspective. 
That's how I see it. Yeah. And it opened up dialogue though. It opened mm. up grown up dialogue now. Mm. Because maybe I would never have said those things to his face. No, no. So that's the beauty of music. You know, you get your story out there in a way you feel confident, you express mm. yourself, you express your true feelings. And when he heard it, it opened up a conversation. And as and that and a, a couple of other incidents, that was when we really connected. That's when it was like the father something kicked off. And I wasn't just felt like this little child anymore. That was like, yeah, I felt like we were connecting as two adults, having yeah. real discussions. So and it ha- made our relationship so, flourish. Yeah. So after that, have you been able to talk about some of the emotions and everything that's that you've been feeling, apart just from maybe him hearing your music? What with him? Yeah, with him. Yeah. Oh, I'm like, do, do, how how real can you get right now? Are you ready to get 100 real? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll get. Okay, cool. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. So, listen, my upbringing. Yeah, you know, family will probably judge me for this, but it is what it is. Yeah, I can only be my authentic self. Um, during the time, my that you know, sorry, talking. sorry, I mean to cut you off. Just you talk about the judging part. I just had a, mm. I just did a, a podcast with Mo, my cousin. Mm. Mm-hmm. And he's going through the same thing with the judging part. And he says, you know, when someone is judging you, you know, they need to look at themselves again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They need to look at themselves, the fact that you're even judging. They need to check themselves. So I don't think you should really worry about that. That's why I'm doing this podcast, because the, uh, I'm sure some of them don't even like the fact that I'm even doing this and putting this all out there. <laughs> because it's yeah, probably, yeah, this course. is a way for us to grow. Yeah, this is what, well, I, this is probably why my dad had a big problem with that track as well. But, you know, it, is, it, it was my reality. Mm. I have the right to tell my story. So, so in my dad's absence at times, I was having, I got, I was kicked out of school, etc. cetera. Mm. Uh, I got into smoking weed, like heavily smoking skunk. Mm. So I had, a, I had problems with addiction in terms of skunk and alcohol. These are things that I don't have to deal with anymore, but I was young. I was a child and dealing mm. with these addictions. And, um, I don't know how old it was. It was, it was a, it was a lot later. It was, it was late like late twenties, but I'd carried this addiction through throughout all my adolescence and throughout my twenties. Mm. And one day I just hear my doorbell go uh, and I'm not working. I'm not doing nothing at this point. I'm, I'm in my dressing gown. There's the ashtrays on the table. The house smells like just completely smells like weed. It's a mess. Yeah. It's like the, the time when you just don't want someone you don't know turning up. No, everything is just like the worst case scenario. I'm like, oh, it's going to be one of my boys want to come around and smoke a split with me or something. So I go to answer the door. And as I pick up the intercom, I'm like, yo, who's this? And he's like, DJ, it's your dad. I'm like, oh, my mind is for, oh, shit. No, mm. no way. And he's like, yeah, come, come up. And if I could have, I would have said, dad, you can't come in. You can't mm-hmm. come in. Sorry. Bye. But m- me and my dad, we don't see each other like that. Maybe I hadn't seen him for a year or two years now. Mm-hmm. So for him to just turn up, you know, I got to be hospitable. So I'm like, all right, dad. Okay, come in. So I buzzed the door, the intercom, and he's coming through. He's coming up the stairs, ready to come and open the door. I've turned around. I've looked to the room. I'm like, there's nothing I can do now. It's too late. My dad's going to see me as I am right now. Oh my gosh. Mm. So he opens the door, come in and he's, he can smell it. He's like looking around, like what's going on. I think this whole episode about him hearing about my music had just kind of gone off as well. There was a lot happening now. And he was like, you know, what, what's going on? Like, what's this? What is this? What's this? You're not working. What's going on? Some, some sort of judgmental energy. Yeah. Yeah. And everything came out. Like I had, I had, I was like a bat, an animal backed into the corner. There was nothing left to hide. This is me now. You've seen it. And I just said to my dad, oh, dad, oh, now you want to come in and play dad. Now you want to come in and tell me how to run my life. Where was you when I was having trouble at school? Where was you when I wanted money for a special school trip or something? Where was you? How come... You didn't invite me to your wedding when you got remarried. How come, where, where, where was, where was, why wasn't I your son then? Why wasn't I your son? Why is it when I go around to your house 
and, and I can't see any pictures on the wall of me. Mm-hmm. Why am I, why can you come in here suddenly out of nowhere, tell me how to live my life and play super dad. But where, where is my presence in your life? Why, when, you know, I said, why have I never been to Gambia with you? But I think the one that shocked me, and even when I told my mom that I said this, was when I said, why, why didn't you invite me to your wedding? And, and I think what, me saying that, why didn't I invite me to your wedding? And why, and um, what, why is my picture not on the wall in your house? And I just said, I, to be frank, I said, get the fuck out of my house. Which I can't even believe I spoke to my dad like that. But I just lost it. Well, how did I you just make you feel after that? Amazing. Yeah. Everything that I could, I was so scared to say. Everything that I'd been holding in, mm-hmm. that I didn't even realize I'd been holding it in, mm-hmm. just came out. And it and it it was that situation where there was like, I think it was a situation where it was like, there was nowhere to. I'd, I'd been caught with with my pants down, bro. I'd been caught with my pants down. I was I was vulnerable, so mm-hmm. there was nothing left. Now there was nothing left for me to. There was no lower that I could go. There was no more judgment I could face. So I, it was no. like, all right, well, I'm here now. Here is this is where all my pain is. This is all my pain. Hear it. And he left. He walked out of the house because I told him get get out. I wasn't very pleasant about mm-hmm. telling him how to go, which I can't believe. I spoke to my like, dad, and he turned around, really with his tail between his legs, if I'm honest, and left, and. I felt like a man, actually. I, was, I didn't feel like a boy anymore. I thought, okay, my dad's probably not proud of who I am right now, mm-hmm. but I am my own man. I owned it. I owned yeah. who I was. And I felt, I felt empowered, but at the same time sad because I was like, right, my dad just walked out. And, mm-hmm. and um, maybe a few days later, he phoned me. And we had the most realist conversation ever. Yeah, and sometimes it takes those, and, and that was a big, yeah. it, that was the beginning of the mm-hmm. of the best friendship. We like mm-hmm. me and my dad became really close after that. Yeah, because that veil has dropped now. You know, now he sees you for who you are, and you have said the things that you wanted to say. And I think it was mature for him to 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 actually come and call you, and and then that conversation started. I think that's that's yeah. one of the that's just the beautiful thing of experiences as a human being. You know, and of course, this is your story. So, and it's a fascinating story. Of course, it's sad that he's not he's not here with us anymore. And one of the the things, obviously, like because I found out about you when you came to Gambia, it was like around 2017, right? And I didn't really know about you. I heard that you had, there. We have a cousin who makes music, or who was a rapper in the UK. And, you know, this was like maybe around 2015, 2016, I think, right around the time um, my my father passed away also, you know. So I then I, I looked up, you know, some of your, you know, your music and I listened to some of the raps and everything. But, um, you know, after that, I think you came to Gambia and, you know, and I kind of want to understand, like, when you came to Gambia and finally for the first time seeing you know, where he come from, you know, maybe then has there been after that a new perspective of how you see him? How, how am I? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Could so, you, could you repeat that question? I know there was a lot of context behind it. So yeah. So I'll, I'll just say, um, yeah, if we just had a little bit of a, um, technical difficulty with the internet, that's, that, that's kind of the annoying thing we're doing a podcast on zoom. <laughs> But so, yeah, um, so you were talking about, um, you know, facing your dad, you know, after for a while now, you know, him coming, you know, into your place and finally seeing you for who you are and you able to finally tell him how you feel. But as I said, you know, he's not here anymore. And, you know, sometimes there's this uh, there's this little bit of feeling when a person is not around anymore to even um, kind of maybe you know talk about it too much you know what i mean but mm-hmm. like i said this is your story you know so from, this is your perspective and with that also like i recently because like i said i didn't know about you until like i think around 2015 or 2016 when i heard that oh you there's you have a cousin he's a rapper you know and i remember going online and, and like looking up to you 
and searching your music and listening to your, some of your, your your raps. And I was so proud. You know what I mean? I was so proud. I was like, wow, he's he's like my cousin. And but, you know, you always, you know, at that age also, so young, you just don't wonder like what happened? Why, 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 why is he there? Why does he live there? Why is he never coming here? And, you know, you end up even having some sort of a resentment, you know, towards this person that you're, you're looking, you know, because you're like, what, why isn't he coming here? You know what I mean? But you don't know the story is actually like it's not his fault. You know what I mean? But at that age, we don't really understand how those things were because we were so young. But then you came to Gambia around 2017. And, you know, you stay with, you stayed in my house, you know, for like a week, but it felt like for such a long time, man. Like it was such a very, it was one of the best memories I've ever had, you know? And so you coming to Gambia, you coming, deciding to come to Gambia and finally coming to meet your, your father's family, you know, seeing where he comes from, seeing who he is kind of in a way, has that give you after the, after that trip, did it give you some sort of a new perspective? Of life or just or everything else uh, okay so my perspective on on things changed before that mm. um but it's just to reframe it's so nice to hear that you're proud of my music as well yeah. like that's, that's beautiful <laughs> and like you're proud that i was family mm. um i also share with you like that week is like one of the most like important weeks of my entire life mm. you know and I'm so glad that you were part of it. Like that's my only time I've ever been to Gambia, which is mm -hmm. a part of my it's, my, it's in my DNA, do you yeah. understand? So that's how important that time was for mm -hmm. me as well. Uh, so yeah, it was an amazing time. Did it change my perspective? My perspective on things around my dad changed earlier. So it's, it's kind of funny as well. So much to unpack from what you said, because you were saying, you were looking at me thinking, oh, why doesn't he come here? Why? I've always wanted to come. I've had to go at my dad for me not coming. Do you understand? That was part of the thing that I was having, like, why haven't I come? And and like, I'm still angry at my dad about certain things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's that, it's what you're saying. It's the perspective. Look how you were probably looking at me in a judgmental way. Like he doesn't, like, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what, my dad would say in response, like when I'm like, some of the things I'm upset about him, mm -hmm. he got it's complicated, man. It's not the way you see it. Yeah. So it's very deep. It's deeper it's deep. than, yeah, it's really deep. So my perspective changed anyway after that, that particular incident I took you back mm -hmm. to, because me and my dad really, really got close as a result. And eventually when he became ill, because, you know, my, my dad passed of, of cancer. Uh, yeah. During that time of illness, I was, you know, staying at the hospital all the time, sat by his bedside, sometimes just me and him. And um, I was with him. I was with him as his soul left this planet, man. I was with him at that moment. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, not the whole, oh, I was there and then got in the car and went off and, mm -hmm. you know, I was there. Yeah. I was there for the the, the, the last breath. You know what I mean? I, I, I truly believe I heard his last words actually in his consciousness. Mm. Um, the last words my dad said to me, oh, this is a lot, boy. The last words that my dad said to me is, T, you're a great son. Yeah. So mission accomplished, you know what I mean? I don't have no uh, regrets about where me and my dad are and I changed and my perspective has definitely like it definitely changed. And that's part of why I went to Gambia afterwards because mm. like I, I wanted to make sure I know my dad, it was important that my, my, like the family was important to my dad and I was part of that family and he want he always wanted me to do yeah. that. And he would, he said, make sure you have a connection with your sisters, which I haven't done as well as I could have. But he also said, you know, like, that's why I went to Gambia. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I went out and I, I built a, a connection with another one of our cousins, Ibby, you know, yeah. she DJs. I'm so yeah. proud of her and her music and what she does. And and so, like, I made an effort. I, I was hospitable to her. I, made, I let mm -hmm. her stay at my house and, mm -hmm. you know, took her to see, you know, cousins mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I made the trip to Gambia, went to see his grave, everything. Like, I've done things where I think, I know my dad would be proud. Like he, he would, he can see that I'm making yeah. the effort that I haven't just like let it, you know, let it go, you know, mm -hmm. met my dad's sisters, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
this is important. So yeah, I made the effort in his absence. I didn't just kind of forget about it. And it's all important to me. So yeah. yeah. But but yeah, like man. you've you you've you've made the effort, of course, because like yeah. I've seen it when you came, you know, I and I made sure I took you everywhere, you know, that you yeah, wanted yeah, to yeah. go so that you could see literally everyone. But also yeah. I feel like we have been made that effort also because you've been there going through with what you're going through. And I feel like you know, I'm not even leaving everybody out. Mm. I'm involving, I'm including everyone from the cousins to the aunties to everyone who should have been there for you. You know what I mean? Mm. You know, we what, tend to sometimes- you, what, when, when specifically like- You know, just overall, just yeah. overall. You know what I mean? Whether they know or they don't know, I mean, yeah. they know. You know, we, we come from a culture where they tend to see things sometimes and just be like, let it go. They don't want to look sometimes. And that's something that needs to really change, you know? So, and for me, even for me also, like when you call me the other day and me coming to you to really just want to know your journey and your rapping career. And then you told me about, for example, what's been happening recently, yeah. you know, because yeah. we recently both became parents but yeah. we still both have different, you know, um, paths with how being a parent, uh, you know, it has been so far. Like I've been able to be around my child and you have not been able to be around your child. So I felt that like the fact that I haven't even been there for you also. Oh, so, nice. you know what I mean? So, yes, you did your part, but I feel like a lot of us haven't really done that. You know what I mean? And I, I and sometimes like, there's even so many other stories that even exist that. I call, I always call him like, why are we not doing this? Why are you not reaching out to this person? Why are you not doing this? You know, we tend to always just ignore because we just don't know. Or we're not 100% sure what's happening. You know, I feel like that's one of the problems that not only family, but culturally that we have. But I'm really glad and the fact that you've built that relationship after with your father, you know, because you were there with your dad, you know, I was in there when he had my dad passed, yeah. you know, and that still haunts me till today, you know, because, you know, even though we had a really good relationship our whole life, but at the same time, just because of, a, you know, him being in a hospital and I was afraid to see him for how, like how he was. Mm. And then by the time I made a decision to decide, okay, was I going out tonight to party? And the next morning they call you or three in the morning tell you that he's gone. I mean, you, you can feel my heartbeat right now. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's heavy. Mm. You know, so even though we both went through certain journeys, mm. but you've got to say the final goodbyes and I never really yeah, got to yeah, say that final goodbye. That must be tough. That must be so, tough or not. And you, so and you, you see like you, life. Yeah. You were, so, uh, you, you, were, know, it's just, you were in your dad's presence all the time. Like you, you've probably spent more time in your father's presence than mm -hmm. I did as well. Mm -hmm. So like that brings itself like that, that sense of loss, like must be super intense. Cause I, I feel the sense of loss and my mm -hmm. dad was a, a consistent presence in my life every day. Whereas yeah. with someone that's in your life pretty much every day and you lose that as well, you're going to really feel that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but you know, that's life and mm. you know, we you know, we all have our ways of dealing with it. But how how have you been able to deal with, you know, like have there been any some sort of a coping mechanism that you're able to deal with this or has it just been mostly your music or work that you are trying to focus that energy on? Well, when my dad passed, that's when I quit smoking. Mm. I quit smoking at all forms like so substance abuse stopped when my dad mm. passed. So that was a gift that he gave me. Know, from beyond the grave, like mm. because I, I just I wanted to improve my life, uh, I did, and then I started having like quite serious relationships as well, and I started to feel things. I realized I'd been self medicating all this time and never really allowing my heart to feel mm. things, you know, never really <laughs> processing emotions, and so now I have the full spectrum of emotions in life. You know, I feel it. I feel joy and pain in a different way now because I'm not just clouding myself you know, smoking and living in the crowd. So, you know, um, so, and then in terms of coping, so I don't know, it's, it's day to day. I think the legacy of it, like, if I'm honest, like I'm still trying to find my feet, um, mm -hmm. with it. And I think I some, feel things you. Im some things impact me more mm -hmm. in his absence. Like, look, 
you know, we, we're talking about new fathers. I, I don't see my son as much as I'd like to. I want mm-hmm. to. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like it's like generational curse. I've got a beautiful <laughs> son that is going through the same thing that I went through as a child, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, my presence isn't there, even though I'm fighting so hard to be part of his life right now. And um, yeah, that I think, it's hurt. It hits me more because mm. of what I've gone through with my dad. It hits me harder in so many yeah. ways because of the, the 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 dealings that I've had um, with my own relationship with my dad, and you know, yeah, with all that wave but, of emotions, right? Yeah, yeah, just the feeling of the sense of rejection as well. Like, mm. like I felt rejected by my dad, and I think that was the beginning. Like when he didn't turn up certain mm. times, and I think the rejection of being ostracized mm. from my from the family unit I was trying to kind of create. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it hurts me even more. And um, and I have more of a desire to be part of his life because of what I went through through my childhood. So, yeah, I mean, it's very difficult. It's the, it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever been through in my, my life, you know? And mm-hmm. ultimately, these are the times when I honestly wish I could call my dad. Mm-hmm. I've never, I, I know I would have had some real conversations. These are the times now, like when I, I I would sit here and have a man to man with my dad for hours on end and say, dad, man, mm-hmm. what do I do? Like, how do I see my son? What do I like? What's going on? Mm-hmm. This this is when I I need my dad, man. I can't lie. I need mm-hmm. him. But he ha- has there been anyone here. in the family, like a loved one who has been kind of helping you cope or deal with these emotions? Like my mom, like my mom's just there and it? she's just there for me. Like mm-hmm. this was like. This is the hardest thing ever, like being separated from your child. Like for me, it happened from when my son was basically two days old. And COVID played a huge part as well, because even when he was born, there was a limited amount of time that I was allowed to be in the space. And it was very, mm-hmm. only one person at a time. It was a it was a whole mess, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's been difficult, but my mum has been there for me, like, I'm not going to lie, like, boy, you know, I was suicidal. Like mm-hmm. I was suicidal. Like it was, it was that bad. Um, like with I was the, waking with up. The, with the, like, you know, you mean with the recent situation, not being with, yeah, able with the to situation. be with him. Yeah. Not yeah. My son, like I, I'm of a certain age. It took me a long time before I, I was committed enough and, and prepared in life. I was very prepared to be a father my housing situation, my employment situation, you know, drive a nice car, my mindset, my focus, my ambition, aspirations, mm-hmm. finances, everything. I was very prepared to be a father. This wasn't something that happened on accident. It wasn't like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm pregnant. You know, it was something that was planned. And um, things rapid took a rapid decline. Mm-hmm. And it was like my dream had been taken away from me. And I had the heartbreak of losing a partner that I loved, mm-hmm. that I was willing to commit the rest of my life to. And this child that I was so excited about bringing into this earth and raising mm-hmm. and righting the wrongs that mm-hmm. I had gone through. Do you know what I'm saying? A chance to put it right. Yeah. And gone. Mm-hmm. And I still haven't got my head around it. Mm-hmm. But I'm in a, like, I'm in a, I'm very, We've been talking on some really heavy subject right now, yeah, yeah? yeah? So naturally, yes, I am slightly emotive at the moment. But in general, I'm very centered and balanced around the subject mm-hmm. and I'm doing, I've got my life into a really good space. Mm-hmm. But there was a period of time when it first kicked off that was unquestionably the hardest thing I've ever yeah, and will ever go through in my life. Mm-hmm. But uh, did you know- With, with with all these things, I don't mean to cut you. You you yeah. you still somehow find a lot of strength. You know, you still mm. seem to be still standing. You still seem to be work, working and doing doing your thing. You still you like you're you're really fighting for it. Where, where are you getting the strength that you like? How how are you finding the strength to be able to deal with this? Because I know some people who are who who are not able to have this. Some people who are really searching for it. Like I'm talking about real people who I know who are dealing with these kind of things. You know, so you have that wealth of experience, you know, so like yeah. what well, I would I would kind of just. Yeah. Like, where do you get the strength? Well, you you mentioned to me you had a friend and you was like, it mm. appears that I'm doing better than him. Right. Mm. In mm. terms of coping with it better. Than yeah. Him. Um, like 
it, I believe me, I was I was a shambles for mm. for a long time and still have bad bad days. Like and there's not a night that I go to bed that I don't think about my child. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't seen my child. He's only two, and I haven't seen him for approaching a year now. Right. Um, and even in the time that he was born, I think there was only like a period of about six, seven months where I mm-hmm. saw him consistently. Mm-hmm. This is through legal proceedings as well, which is very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I should be seeing my son much more often legally and That's legally, good, yeah. he li- and legally he lives with me, believe it or not. Yeah. But I, I haven't seen him for, and so I have to go through the process and it takes yeah. time and I will, I won't, I will never give up. I'll never give up. Of Put course. that on the record. Of course. I'm never going to give up. So, it, you know, I, um, I, I will be part of my son's life, but um, how, how do I cope? I don't know. Like you've got no choice. Um, I think I do honestly feel like the, I've got to such a low point um, that I, I realized this is the space that people are in when they choose to give up. Like, mm-hmm. and when I say give up, I mean, just call, call, call it quits. Call it I'm done. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. That, that's the space I was in. This is the, That's how dark it was. I, it was hard, but mm-hmm. I just thought about my mom and I thought about my son. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? And I thought, well, it, my mom would feel the way I feel now. If I did that, if you were not around, she, I'd yeah. take her to the space I'm in now because she's lost her son. Like I, like I feel I've lost mine and that, that pain of it. And I was like, I can't do that to my mom. So she was a, like being like, like thinking how terrible it would be on other people to do that. Mm-hmm. And then think about my son and thinking, oh, you know, I never met my dad or I never got to see my dad or I don't know. So mm-hmm. those were my motivations to keep hanging on and pray mm-hmm. that there was a better better path ahead. Yeah. But the coping me- me- mechanisms that I used, I, I very quickly started to look into like spiritual stuff. Yeah. And mm-hmm. this is like, so anyone out there that's thinking, how, how do I get through a dark space? Mm-hmm. And a lot of it was like meditation was like gaining some control over the anxiety or the depression, like controlling my body from inside, mm-hmm. breathing, calming all the thoughts that were telling me worst case scenarios in my head Mm -hmm. and just like silencing that, that distressed voice in my mind that was saying, this isn't going to work out and just silencing it, calming it, getting deep, like Mm -hmm. meditating. Meditation was absolutely key. Mm -hmm. And then visualizing, trying to visualize something better. Like what does my future look like? What do I want my future to look like? Even if I was so far from that space, Mm-hmm. Then it was the gym. I haven't been for ages, right? So it was a combination of meditation, visualization, and the mm-hmm. gym. Yeah. Going to the gym and I went like every friggin' day. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was like, I'm I realized there was a chemical imbalance now. This was not just yeah. mental. Of course, there it was is. a chemical imbalance in my body. And I'm I I, I called it biological warfare. It's like I'm going to put more endorphins, more testosterone, more, I'm going to change the chemical makeup in my body by physically doing mm. exercise, doing stuff to change it. And then I started juicing as well. So mm. it'd be like, as, as nutritious as I could, I'm putting beetroot, spinach, banana, I'm walnuts, yeah. everything, every day. I know it sounds simple, mm. but it was changing. As far as I was concerned, it was changing the chemical makeup in my body. It does. It does. Exercise is one of the best things, bro. Like I, like it's the same thing. I have been through so much shit. Like I can tell you, I'm still dealing with my dad's issue till today. Even though it yeah. looks all happy and stuff yeah. in the house here, but I'm still dealing with it. And like I would actually tell you that I haven't even said anything to anybody. I guess I'm saying it here. Like just yesterday, I think I had my first ever panic attack in the in the train station. I was like, "What the f is this? Yeah. Like, what is going on? Like, yeah. you know what I mean?" And I'm sitting there. My wife is looking at me like. She's confused, like, what's happening? You know, for the first time ever. And all I was keep repeating was, of course, calling God and trying to make sure that I'm I'm not going to let this, whatever that's going on in me, win. Whatever this chemical issue that's going in my body, it's not going to win. Mm-hmm. And always what I, how I deal with it has been exercise. And yeah, I haven't been to the gym for the whole week. <laughs> Maybe it's because of that. But like, that's what I've been doing. So physical exercise is one of the best thing to deal with any form of, 
stress, anxiety, depression, or whatever it is, and just keeping a very healthy, balanced diet like is one of the best things. You know, it it will definitely switch every, you know, weird sort of chemical balances that is going on, you know, in your body. You know, it 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 works. But yeah. like like that as well. But also that that's the physical aspect, but mentally, mm-hmm. because panic attacks, that's like anxiety and that's your mind. Mm-hmm. Your mind, that's when your mind is running away with you. It's your mm-hmm. mind that creates that situation mm-hmm. and releases all that whole that chemical balance gets your heart racing and yeah. whatever else is going on, right? But so like the two things there, like prayer or, you know, mm-hmm. prayer or um, meditation mm-hmm. or combination of both, mm-hmm. you know? Someone said meditating is like listening to God and prayer is like talking to God. I'm not really a religious person. But yeah, I, get, I was going to ask, get, how, get, how is your relationship with, with, with God? Yeah, I, ha- I have one. Um, but you know, I don't necessarily follow any kind of religion as such. Uh, mm-hmm. And I worry, I, again, I worry to judge because I, I'm so proud of my family. I can see that they're devout in their ways. Yeah. And I know like, this is another thing that I wanted to talk about in connection with when you talked about family and mm-hmm. should maybe linking up and why I haven't reached out and stuff mm-hmm. like this. The, yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's things around that where sometimes actually I, I wonder whether they're I've always thought, felt like people were ashamed of me, right? Because of, you know, my mom, the white woman, the heritage. Yeah, the religion part of it. Not the pure Gambian, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And all of that. And and me and my different background. So that makes me feel sometimes like I don't Mm. belong. Or or maybe you guys feel like I don't belong, you know? Mm. Like it creates this kind of element of separation and it's Mm. hard for me to... So even when I say like, what's my relationship with God? And I'm like, well... It's a bit different, but it, there is a relationship there. Mm-hmm. And I don't look at anyone and go, oh, what you're doing is is wrong. I just, no. I'm, I'm on a different journey, I guess, with it. So, mm-hmm. but yeah. yeah you know, like, in, in our culture, like, as you know, like for you come from Gambia and it's 95% Islam, but mm-hmm. culturally there is this other thing of you're in another country and you become with another person, you know, your family or your culture, not every family, but the culture kind of sees you like, you've left your, you know, what, what your culture is about. You know, you were supposed to be a Gambian. Yeah. And this is a subject that has never been really talked about. And I'm going to try to bring it up, not just for you, but there's a lot of other stories. Like it's even the same story with my, my wife, for example. And, you know, I don't want to talk about it too much, but because that's her story, but it's a lot of those things happening where the father always leaves. You know what I mean? So, it has nothing to do with the religion. It has nothing to do with the religion. It's just the human being itself, himself, you know, doing wrong. Because the way God describes how everything is supposed to be, you know what I mean? That's just the right way. And if you follow it, you will do right things. And even if you make mistakes, whether it's not really a mistake, it's just how your life is supposed to be. You still owe to still follow and to make sure you take care of whatever that. Like whatever is a child or whatever, whatever it is, you have to be there because a, a human being, like a Muslim person, for I would say somebody who submits their will to God, you have to be a, a, a certain type of person. You know, you're not supposed to look at things and take things, uh, you know, make things look like, oh, is, is something wrong or is because my culture doesn't say this, so I can't follow that. You know, it's that's when the issue comes in. So, and I understand from your perspective, if you would have those kind of questions, but have you ever asked somebody close to the family, for example, like, why is it that way? No, no, I haven't. And uh, mm. I don't, it, because sometimes I wonder how much of it is, you know, what I believe, mm. you know, how much of it is my own insecurity mm. and how much of it is actually true. And it's a different, and it's a very, very difficult conversation, yeah. you know? Mm. So, and it's hard, it's hard to approach those subjects, mm. but you know, whether you call, whether you're talking about God, some people say Allah, some people say the universe, some people say source energy, whatever, mm-hmm. that has been faith has and belief, mm-hmm. not even in a, in a grand concept, of, but in, in, in a, in a better time coming mm-hmm. forward mm-hmm. beyond hope, hope to me. I've got, you know, I heard a saying and it's, it's a bit harsh, but hope is a beggar. 
Hope has an element of doubt in it. Mm. Faith, there's no doubt. Faith is like, I know this is going to happen. Mm. So I, I, I try to veer from hope as far as I can and take all that doubt away and get closer and closer to faith. Like, I believe this is what will be. Mm. And as I've gone into that road and, to- and, and taken those steps, like I said, with exercise, meditation, good nutrition. Mm. Yeah, it sounds basic, mm. but then that has guided me to take action in my life that has led to other positive things and more positive outcomes. And in terms of like career-wise, like work-wise and stuff like that, and investments and stuff that I've got going on. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. Be- I'm probably in the best place I've ever been. Yeah. Mm. But it's just this unresolved issue of access to my on my son and my role as a father, which is so, so mm. important to me. Mm. But you know? tell me about your work. So what have you been doing now? Because, you know, your, your, your career started in rapping mm. and, mm. you know, you went through obviously different chapters in your life. So mm. what have you been doing right now? You know, okay, so like, share that. All, yeah, yeah. So all my experience in music, um, like as a, as a hip hop artist, there's a like, kind of a natural evolution as you give back to the community. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's young people and you teach them a little bit and you work and you mentor with young people mm-hmm. that are going through trials and tribulations or mm-hmm. coming up with the same sort of barriers and challenges that you, you went mm-hmm. through. And, and rap is a great way to connect because a lot of those young people aren't connecting with teachers in their mainstream schools and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So when you say you're a rapper, they're, they're all ears, they're engaged and you can communicate and you can maybe help them get onto a good path so that they, that they don't make mistakes or, you know, end up in prison or whatever else it might be. Yeah. Um, and so when people realize you are able to engage with young people like that, you find that a lot of organizations will tap into that. They'll, you know, you get paid for free. Like you get paid as a, like a facilitator. So mm-hmm. you can go teach a rap workshop, mm-hmm. go, you know, it's almost like you're a teacher, you know, but from the streets and a lot of that started to happen as a hip hop artist. Suddenly I was doing all these workshops with young people, rap workshops here and rap and dance and this, that, and the other traveling all around mm-hmm. the UK working with young people in that capacity. And, um, that then melds into an, an area of education. Yeah. Really what we're talking about is education now. So it's like, it's the, the combination of your creative skills and your artistry as an artist. But now with the teaching aspect, you're now entering the world of education. And so that was happening for me. And then it basically, I managed to fuse a couple together. And so I'd worked in a couple of institutions that were music schools, you know, where they offered degrees and various different aspects of creativity, like creative arts degree. And then did that for a bit at a couple of places. And now, you know, I'm at the Arts Council, which is kind of like a, a public body, like a, a arms lift organization to the government. Mm-hmm. So we take all the money from Department of Culture, Media and Sports, Department of Education, so the government, you know, mm-hmm. these budgets come to us. And we make sure that we're funding art and creativity in, in mm. England. So I'm involved in that. So mm. as a result, you know, I'm I'm just I'm helping decide on what projects get funded. Yeah. I'm looking after the organizations, the big cultural organizations that get mm. lots of funding through um, lots of funding. We go and look after, we have a relationship with them and make sure that, you know, they're doing what they say they'll do and that they, mm. and everything so that they they continue to get their funding and we support mm. them. And so it's massive because, yeah. you know, I work particularly with the music team and also with the music education team. So it's, it's massive because mm. it's like, a, it's the opportunity to have so much influence. You're, yeah. you're having an influence on how money's being spent, how that's going to help communities, how young people have access to music and coming up because music was a vital part, you know, as we discussed earlier, yeah, when I was going through hard times, music was the healing factor. Mm. And it gave me a path and it gave me a purpose and it, and it helped me emotionally. It, it connected with me with my dad and all of that yeah. stuff. So it has so much power. So being in a position now where I'm able to, you know, help mm-hmm. a custodian of public money, making yeah. sure that all the right arts and the right communities are getting helped and have opportunities and access to music, art, culture. Mm. And knowing the transformative power of those things and how that helps communities. Like I'm in a very privileged position and it's yeah. great. I get to go to shows all around the country. I get to see amazing performances. I get to meet amazing influential people. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great job. It's a great yeah. job and it's very fulfilling. 
That's that's good. That's good. And you know, I know there's a lot of, you know, things always also you're going through. But have you ever thought about making a movie or a book about your story? Because I think it's such a fascinating story. Cool. You know, that that part you were explaining about your dad walking in and coming in, the way you explained it, I was sitting here literally visualizing it. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. can I make this an animation? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And yeah. I know that was not a funny thing, but it was just yeah. like, like you were explaining it so well. You know what I mean? And have you ever thought about putting it in film or doing something with you? You know, using that. I have. Do- I have done a short film before, so mm. I've had the experience of it, and th- and it's taught me a lot. Like it's hard. Like when it comes to film, like you need a lot of people involved. Like you know, at the end of a film, when you see mm. the credits rolling at the end, and yeah. it's like. How many names? Yeah, a yeah. lot of names. Yeah. But now I re- yeah, but now I realize why you compartmentalize things. If you really want to make it good, like you can maybe write and direct, but don't try write, direct, cast, produce this that because you'll spread yourself thin and you won't be able mm-hmm. to deliver the quality that you want. You end up doing everything, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's challenging. Um, but you know, you know, I have an uncle that says you gotta have a story to tell. Yeah, and every time he sees me going for a challenge, he looks because he's like got this uh, this faith that you will overcome it. He goes, and you'll have a story to tell, mm. you know, and you'll have a story to tell. Mm. And he's proud of that, the fact that it adds substance to you. You know, mm. you meet people, and people have a certain level of respect for someone where they're like that didn't have it easy, that didn't have it just on of the course. straight and narrow. Of course. And there's a certain level of respect that comes with that. It's like, mm. you know, when you're overcoming barriers and you're overcoming challenges. So yeah, I do, I know I have a story to tell, but you know, I'm still in the mix right now. Mm. Like, yeah, I know I got something big coming, you know, mm. and that, that's, that's, so I'm, if, if this is a film, you know, mm. I'm in the middle, ch- I'm in the middle chapter because by the end of this film, I'm going to be killing it. And me and my son are going to have the most amazing relationship. Do you understand? Yeah. But right now, I still got this unresolved issue. Mm. And I can't tell this story until I know how this, this matter is resolved. How you know? the story goes. So yeah. so, yeah. So will I tell the story? Probably. You know, there's a creative in me. And I don't know what format, whether it will be in an album, mm. whether it will be mm. a, a book, whether it will be a film. Who knows? But, you know, that creativity exists within me. Um, yeah, true. It, it will I probably find its way. It will find its way. That's yeah. But but yeah. as you said earlier about what your uncle said, I think that's what makes us human. You know, that respect you have for somebody when they tell you their story and they, they've gone through a lot, you know, you you already see, you know, you already kind of treat them in a different way, you know, because that's what human humanity is all about. That's what being a human is supposed to be. You know, like for us, me read the Quran, when I go through certain things and God talks about that, I will test you. You will go through stuff. I will, you know, like there's so many tests that comes with it. Because like, for example, I was listening to a to a video the other day and this guy was talking about that. You know, God, God only shows you sometimes, sometimes the end of the story. You know, not for everybody, but he usually shows you the, pl- the end. Or he makes you go through things so that he can prepare you for the end or for whatever that is coming so you can be able to handle it. But he never tells you the plan. He never tells you exactly what it is. Like when when he showed Joseph like the dream about him being, you know, um, being, you know, to sit on that throne, he didn't tell him the process. He didn't show him that, okay, you, are, you will go to jail though. You will be thrown in a pit and, you know, like your brothers will throw you for like, you know, all those things Like he didn't, he didn't have to say all those things. But then when he got to that end part, then he realized, okay, so this was the journey. So the journey was never, it's never going to end. And I feel like every human being, you should go through certain struggles in your life. You're going to go through all the pains and all the tests, but it's about how you get back up, how you stand back up and make sure that you're not defeated because you're going through the right direction, even though if there's a lot of bad things that are happening in your life. So I think that's, that's the beauty of being a human being because you grow. You know what I mean? You you grow a lot. And, mm. you know, for me, whatever I go through, that's how I just think about it. You know, like I said yesterday, when I felt that way, I'm sitting here thinking like, you know, it's, there is something at the end of the road. You mm. know what I mean? So I may, I just have to make sure I don't give up. I'm not going to say is- those words like, like, fuck it. You know what? I'm yeah. done. You know, because now hearing your story, that just lifts me up today. That just lifts me up. And if somebody is going to hear his story, that's going to lift them up. And then be like, okay, I got to keep moving and I keep going through and I have to keep going. 
So that's that's just the beauty of it, man. Well, you this know? is this is this is what I mean. That that goes back to that point, though. You know, when you talked about you know God showing Joseph a dream or mm-hmm. a vision, and like he not knowing how and all the things that will mm-hmm. occur for him to get into that space that he sees in his dream. And it goes back to what I was saying, like one of the biggest things that I did during the course of like when things were really, really bad for me mm-hmm. is, is the visualization. Mm-hmm. So that's the dream. That is the dream. Yeah. And that's the same as, you know, God giving Joseph the dream. That's mm-hmm. God giving me my dream. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I have a certain vision. I won't even share what it is. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't even understand mm-hmm. how I'll get there. No. That like it's it it doesn't even it's not even the kind of thing I've ever visualized before, but I have a certain vision. Mm-hmm. And I just keep that vision going. Like, and as time's gone on, the vision makes more sense. When I first had it, it was just seemed preposterous. It's mm-hmm. like, why am I even thinking of this? But as time's going on, I'm like, oh my gosh, things are happening which make that vision seem much more achievable and realistic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, like I say, I don't know the process between me and that vision. Mm-hmm. I just hold the vision and the mind is so powerful. It will navigate you. It will guide you like a, like a guided missile. Mm-hmm. It will, oh, I'm going off trajectory. Let me just adjust. Oh, gone too far that way. Oh, oh, until you line and you're and that vision, mm-hmm. you'll find your, you'll find your way to that vision and, and hit that target. It will just keep guiding you. So yeah, it, it's the same as what you were saying about the dream. That someone yeah. implanted, and the same for you. And and you, you say your friend's going through these troubles. You know, you know. Tell your friend. Tell your friend right now, whether it's a son or daughter that he hasn't seen for, or they or they haven't seen for mm. however long. Visualize his child saying, "Dad, I miss you. I've missed you." Visualize your child giving you a hug. Visualize being in the park playing with your child, mm. and 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 watch then watch the power of that visualization. Like keep that thought strong because things will line themselves up. Things will line themselves up. Your actions that you take will guide you towards that vision. Definitely. That's very powerful words, man. Mm-hmm. Man, Tijan, this was a, this was a really great conversation, man. This was, yeah, man. you, you were very brave to come here and talk about this, you know, like, <laughs> you got me, powerful, bro. man. I cried, bro. I cried in the middle of it, man. What? But that's Jeez. the beauty of it. It's okay. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, um, me talking about my dad, that's another thing. I haven't talked, I haven't said that to anybody for such a long time. Mm. So, and I know there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot deeper because these kind of stories, you can't just touch on top of it. There's a lot of it, you know, but I'm really glad this is the first step. And of course, I want us to really connect, you know, offline because I yeah, want to really- say be there for you. You know, I'm, I I don't want to, every person that I talk to, I don't want to just, you know, that's why I'm very picky with the people I talk to. You know what I mean? I want to connect with people so that after we hit the stop button of the recording, I want to make sure that I'm seeing what you're doing. I'm seeing, trying to connect with you because that's, that's what I want. Cause I, I'm, I'm going through my own journey mm-hmm. and we talking to other people means that I'm dealing with a lot of shit. So talking to can other I people. Ask, can I ask you something at this yeah. point? Yeah. Okay. So first, I, I want to put a caveat. When you, when you first had a child, yeah, mm-hmm. when I was first informed that you had a child, mm-hmm. I was so happy, but I was in a very painful space. Mm-hmm. And still to this day, when I see buggies or dads and the kids in the park, it's a trigger for me. It's it's, mm-hmm. it's not easy and it's, it's hard to escape. Of course. It's everywhere. Um but I was happy for you. But at the same time, it brings up a lot of pain. Cause I'm mm-hmm. like, wow, you know, he's living the life that I aspire to live. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure it comes with all its challenges. I've probably romanticized it. Yeah. yeah. But um, man, I would love to know how is fatherhood treating you? How does fatherhood chill? You know, honestly, like, you know, um, like you said, when you see things, it triggers you. I, I try to not even show that part online on social media a lot you know once in a while you catch yourself posting a picture or whatever you know I've, my my that's that's been my wife um my wife's job but uh, yeah you know you why know, not it's such why, a, why, why not show those why not share that no those moments 
like you said, there there is that part of other people who are going through that, of what you're going through. But also, I believe in protecting my child from social media. You know, I don't want to use my child as some sort of a, so people right. can come see because she looks good. She's cute and all these. I don't like that. I don't like giving people what they want. You know, we're living in a time now where you have to kind of give people what they want on social media, whether you have to dance or whether you have to show your personal life. I'm not, that's not me. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I can talk about it and share certain things so people can learn, but just for the fun of it. No, I don't, I don't, that's not me. But um, yeah, like that feeling, man, it's, it's, it's a really, like I would say the first four, four months, it was just really trying to figure out who, like who this person is. Like, you know, there was a, there was a switch. There was a change in my, in my, in my mind, like in my mental state, a lot of things were changing, but it's a type of love that you cannot really explain, man. Like when you say unconditional love, you know, I never really heard my dad say, I love you or my mom say, I love you, but I knew that they loved me, you know, but seeing this this child man i remember like i i can just say the first time something happened to her when i had to run to the hospital you know like she had a night terror i think i talked about it on the podcast before and i finished praying and i was running even though the hospital was just like two minutes away but i was holding her running so fast to just see that if she this person could they could figure out what's going on with her and it was nothing actually she just had a, a, a nightmare. <laughs> she just had a nightmare. But as a baby having a nightmare, it looks scarier than a human being having, uh, a grown person having a nightmare. Mm-hmm. So after that day, because I'm I'm this type of person that I don't show emotions to a lot when it comes to like, you know, this lovey-dovey, oh, I love you. You know, like I've, mm-hmm. I've never been that type of person. So I never really mm-hmm. imagined myself being mm-hmm. in this situation where I'm, I have a wife and I have a, mm-hmm child and I'm a father you're calling me you know papa or whatever like mm-hmm. it's such a weird thing mm-hmm. so every day is really a new experience like I'm not very good with like <laughs> I'm not maybe answering your question very well or expressing yeah. it in a way but it's something it's a type of love that you cannot really describe you know it's like it's basically like a like I have this hostility of like anybody who messes with that I will I will probably go to a very dark okay, place so this- this is what happened to me the minute yeah, my job. Like, like if anybody- I, I became protective. Yeah, like yeah so I became protective. a protector. Yeah. But the problem is when you're kept away from the child, mm-hmm. it's dangerous because that instinct to protect is still there. Mm-hmm. And it, you're it being kept away. So everything is an enemy. Mm-hmm. Everybody. And that's the, the purpose. The system, the, system, the yeah. judge, even your co-parent becomes- yeah. The yeah. enemy, because you're keeping me from my child. And like you, the only instinct that's happened is that you actually want to protect your care parent and the child, but you are in a, you're a completely different person. The the love I say, even from a distance is unconditional. Fortunately, I don't know what happens to my child on a day to day basis. Mm-hmm. He could be, he could have gone hospital for all I know. I have to, I have to imagine the best and hope for the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I can't, I can't be there, but mm-hmm. that's the same. From a yeah. distance or with them, mm-hmm. I love I love that child uh, mm-hmm. like the best thing. And my child was born under very very difficult. Like we were in hospital for five days before he was born. Like it mm-hmm. was, and the labor was very long and traumatic mm-hmm. as well. But at one point, I thought I lost both of them mm-hmm. uh, because of the um, you know you know heart rate stopping of both mm-hmm. of them. Or they were on the monitors and everything just. And I thought I lost both of them and the fear that came over me, the mm-hmm. desire to protect them and look after them. Like you said, the night terrorist was mm-hmm. enough to make you go sprint, like you would have done anything. And yeah. that's the same. And to this day, like, even though I have like a huge dispute um, and I can't see my child, uh, I'd, be, I'd be straight, like I'd be straight and, and I'll maintain this till whatever happens. Mm-hmm. You know, I will look after both of them regardless yeah. of what, what's been yeah. done to me. I will look after both of them. Mm. So the dad, because it's your purpose, you know. Duty. When, when yeah. once you take that purpose of of the man of that protector purpose, it's like he doesn't have anything anymore, and that's what a lot of people yes. don't understand. That's what society doesn't understand. And of course, I don't want to get into the society shit because we'll, otherwise, we'll be sitting here for hours. You know, oh, like God. there's yeah. so much shit that's happening. You know, with who gets to be with the child and who doesn't have, mm. you know, all those issues. But once when that purpose is taken away, because I've become a protector. 
I feel like I've been running around. I have to make sure that this person is going to have a better future, even though I have no idea what my future looks like or where I'm going or who I, I don't even, I still haven't even figured out my, myself. Mm. But still, I'm like, every single day, I got to go. I got to keep going. That's why, like I said yesterday, when I fell that way in that train station, I was like, I am not going to lose. Like, this is the wrong time for this shit or whatever that's going, coming to my head. You are coming the, the wrong time because I'm not going to let you take over. And I know it's good to process. It's important for me to process that, but it's not the time for it. You know, because, you know, I, I want to be there for her. You know, whether whether I'm there physically or mentally, I have to be there. Even if they're right next to me, I have to still be there for, for them, you know, like mentally also. You know what I mean? Because you you have to be sane to do this. Because it's a very yeah. difficult job, also. Like it's like a it's like an it's a it's a twenty four hour work. Mm-hmm. You know, and for the mothers it's difficult. But I feel like they don't talk about the father's issues a lot. What the father goes through, that's what they're missing. You know, they've this all they all all focus about what the woman is going through, the post pregnancy, this and this and this and this and this and that, and they forget that the father goes through something, especially when what you're going through. So so yeah, so it's just like that, man. You know, but yeah. I, I hope, like you said, you're gonna get to be with him soon. And I'm well, like, he's your family, man. He's your family. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and like I got a mission. Like my mission won't be complete until you know you guys have met him. Yeah, what's his name? Chase. Chase. Yeah, yeah. Chase Brom Bromley. Yeah. yeah, but in my books, he is Salah. Chase Salah. Salah. Let's just say yeah. Chase Salah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dijan, man, this this was a great conversation, man. I really appreciate connecting with you. Thank you love for you, having the courage, you, and hey, bravery. Tell your child you love him, man. If you, yeah, my dad didn't do it, so you like you got that same genetic thing going on. Like you say, you don't do it, man. It's I okay do it. To, good, good. I do it. I Break do that it. cycle. I do it. I don't have a problem Break with that it. cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do it. it's already broken. <laughs> Way to end on this, man. Well, yeah, I love man. you, cuz I love. I you. love you, man. I love cool. you. All right, man. Cool. I'm going to call okay. you soon. Okay. Let's do that, bro. All right, Peace. man. Take care. And everyone, goodbye. <laughs>